Right, I hope you have your Bibles out and your outline sheet there and you can follow along and your pen and write down notes and all kinds of things. And then uh, keep a booklet. We handed out booklets a year ago or more uh, where you can keep all your stuff in there and, and refer to it from time to time. We're studying the book of James and of course we're up to what I call lesson number 10. I've entitled it uh, A Time for Remembrance and it's James chapter 4. Verses 13 to 17, not many verses, but I looked at those verses and I said, there's a lot of stuff there that we can find good teachings from the Word of God on. So we'll move from there. Now, perhaps the greatest sin in our humanity's existence, and it's pertaining to what we're going to study today, is our arrogance to try and build a world without reference to God. Isn't that what we have? What are our Democrats and, and the uh, socialists trying to do right now? Eliminate him completely. All the laws and principles that he's taught and given us in the Word of God, and, and somehow they are going to bring us a, a new bright future. You know, the new bright future has been tried before and it's failed miserably all over the world. But they are blinded. They cannot see that in any way. Well, America, of course, should be one who always gives thanks to God uh, for his past presence and deliverance, which he has given us, and mercy to us as a nation. And how thankful we ought to be that we have been and still are the most blessed nation in the world. Amen? Amen. And we certainly are. We have, think about it, we have the greatest and most abundant land and resources. We've now reached the point where we are the most oil-rich nation in the world. Okay? Think about that. Think about the geographic protection we have on both sides of the United States. Huge oceans. So <coughs> no enemy can really technically come at us without having to sail those oceans uh, with their manpower to come uh, to invade our shores here. We, above all the other nations of the, of the world right now, are still a land of peace. We certainly are. And it's because we have the greatest laws and the greatest freedoms of anyone else. We should be giving thanks to God for all of these good things, but we are not doing that. But it isn't anything that's new. It's been going on for centuries. And unfortunately, it was going on in the first century, near the end of it, in the time when James had written his book here. James takes us, of course, in a very timely fashion, because it applies to us today, to examine and review our place as a church in the world, the secular world in which we live. Now, we're going to look at our humanity in relationship to the sovereignty of God. It's very important because the sovereignty of God rules the will of God. And the will of God is to rule everything in the creation that is there. Now today's lessons, of course, are going to concern the will of God. And James was ex examining it or studying it in what was happening in the churches of God in that time in his first century here. So let's take a look what's going to happen in that very thing. Now, nevertheless, the Bible consistently through the dispensational ages. And by the way, for those who don't know it, I'm a dispensationalist in my theology. And remember, we studied dispensationalism, uh, 10 or 12 lessons of it, and all of us that surrounded this lovely phrase, I'll put it up on the screen. What is God doing? He's building a perfect company of believers in harmony with His perfect will, to love Him with a perfect love, and to be like Him and with Him throughout a perfect eternity. That's what God is doing. And nothing is going to thwart His plans. Mm -hmm. Nothing at all. So, you know, we don't have to worry about all the things that go on around us here. We, we need to be concerned about them in what areas we can change and do things. But nonetheless, God is going to have His way. But, you know, it gets back to the very first time when God created Adam and Eve and our first parents. You know, when God created the universe and there wasn't a human being alive in the universe there... There was only one will in the universe, and that was the sovereign will of God. Now, when God made man, he made man with the ability to have his own will, but a will that would be in conjunction with God's will, 100%, which is right up here in this statement here. But in giving him that freedom to make that choice, God knew in advance that Adam and Eve would choose to exercise their own will that would be contrary to God's will. 
And of course, that is called the sin nature, and that sin nature was born in every human being that came forth from Adam and Eve, which is you and me today, and everyone in the world, and everyone who will be in this world until Christ stops uh, the ongoing production of the human race. And since then, of course, there have been billions and billions, I could add to it, billions of alien wills that are contrary to God. And this was going on in the church at the time of James. And it goes on in churches in the time of you and me today as well here. But the point is, they were sub to submit their wills in believing in Jesus Christ to God's will and only His will. You know, when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, that was one of the terms that God had for you to receive Jesus. And that was to turn your will over to God's will and that you would now allow His will to rule through your will completely, 100% for all eternity, meaning that Christ would live through you. Now, a lot of people are not taught that when they're taught to come to Christ. They're not understanding that. But that's what it really is. You have surrendered yourself to God, and then God gives himself to you. It's kind of like the enemy uh, all of a sudden having arms and chasing you, and the enemy surrenders. How does the enemy surrender? By keeping his arms and keeping his desire to run over and take over your land? No. He surrenders and drops his weapons and allows you to rule them. That's what it is to be a believer in Jesus Christ. And the point is really important because God doesn't save rebels. He only saves those who surrender their will to Christ. And so think about that. Without that, no one can be a believer. And I'm talking to people online who uh, maybe are to the far-flung corners of the world. If you're a believer in Christ, that is the condition to be a believer in Christ. And you're probably going to find, if you are a believer in Christ, that through the days and ages you live, uh, that you're going to meet a lot of people who turn away from those things and who change it and later say, well, they don't want those things and they never wanted them. But that's another story. But going on here, we're going to uh, look at James chapter 4, verses 13 to 17. Now, I've been using uh, the dramatized Bible, uh, but the uh, dramatized Bible is ill uh, this week. So uh, I'm going to read it in place of it and then we'll pray, all right? Here it goes. Take a look. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to this or to that city and we'll spend a year there and we'll carry on business and we'll make money. So James says, why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, James says, you ought to say, <laughs> my, my, my mover wasn't moving. If it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. And all such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good that they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Let's pray. Father God, they're short verses, but they speak so much and so well and important in what we're learning today. So I pray, Father, use these words in our hearts as we open them, as we dissect them, as we put them together in easy portions to understand and apply, and that above all, those who are listening today who may be online uh, and uh, the, uh, through the Internet may not know Jesus Christ personally, I pray that he will open their hearts to see him clearly and receive him as Savior. Now for us who have received him as Savior, help us to realize about this whole concept of God's sovereign will versus our own will and find out where we stand in relationship to that today through the Word of God. And if there be any errors or any ways that are wrong, I pray for full repentance and a conception of God's will and gracefully by every heart. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in the weeks uh, of study uh, that are ahead here, we're going to look at uh, three things beginning now, and that is a time of remembrance, the principle of forgetting God, the precept of forsaking God in verses 18 and 19, and then we're going to back up because that's a good place to end, 
and the promise of following God. These are important uh, points. Now, in last week's study, James began with explanation of the early church's attempt. Now, remember this. Two things were going on. The people of God seemed to want to take over God's rule, His sovereign rule, of the lives of other Christians. They wanted to rule their lives because they thought they knew better. And James rebuked them for that very thing. Well, this week here, uh, he's going to examine and explain and condemn them uh, for these Christians who are taking God's role of rulership away from God over their own lives. They were not submitting themselves to the rule and purpose of God. So let's take a look at it and see how it pans out, all right? Here's the first one, the principle of forgetting God, verses 13 and 14. Let's look at it again. Now listen you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city and spend a year there and carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Indeed, a good explanation. So, the first and foremost attitude sinners display, that's you and me, of course, towards God's will, is, even before you were saved, to forget it, to dismiss it, to reject it, and of course, well, just ignore it. Isn't that what the world does today? They just want to do that. Then in the midst of that false reality that many people are living under, sinners plan to live and operate, think about this, without any reference to God or to a sovereign will. As far as they're concerned, it doesn't exist. And this, of course, was the height of fallen sinful man's human arrogance, to think that. You know, God brought us into his world that he created. God brought us in as tenants to live in his establishment in this place called earth. You and I and every human being is a tenant and we've been called in to live freely here and to be given so much by the landlord which is the owner and the creator God himself. And for us as the tenant to raise our fist to the landlord and shake it at him and tell him, we're not going to do anything for you or what you want, and we're going to take everything that is here and claim it's ours. Oh, really? Well, the landlord has something to say about that, and he's going to do that as well. So sinners live that way. They, they operate without any reference to uh, the sovereign will and ownership of God, of themselves and the land. Now this, of course, as I said, the height of human arrogance here. Yet the earliest record of human existence reveals that the greatest desire that Adam and Eve began with was to rule themselves. And of course, uh, it came, later on, it came to rule others. And that's where wars uh, come in as well. And so it gave birth to what is out there now for centuries, let's face it, the false religious and lunatic beliefs, if I could use that term, of atheism, agnosticism, right? Secularism, and of course we have it in the church called religious liberalism. Indeed, all are the arrogant expression of sinful men's desire to say to God, get lost. We don't want you in our life. We don't want you in our presence, and we will not have you to rule over us. It's amazing God didn't just swoop down his hand and destroy the human race, but he didn't do that. He's swooping his hand down gently, and he's saving some from the human race. Aren't you glad you're in that group? I praise God that he saved me. You know, the longer I'm saved, the longer I say it to Ursula, and I mean it. The longer I'm saved, the longer I, I understand that I should have never been saved. And I mean that. I, I, there's people out there who are unsaved that I think are better than me. And you know people who are unsaved and maybe better than many Christians who are out there today. But anyway, James is not talking to the unbelievers, okay? He's not. He's talking to believers, to those who are claiming, at least claiming to be believers here, and of course, possibly, who were they in the church? Well, they were many of the leaders, the rulers, the influential people in the church who ran the church. Now, they were house churches in those days, but they still had groups of leaders uh, that were there. But the question is, they were claiming to believers and being influential believers, and what were they saying? Uh oh today or tomorrow we're going to go to this or that city and spend a year there and carry on our business and make money. They had their lives all planned out. They assumed that they could get done anything they wanted to. 
You know, it's kind of what our young people are taught today. You know, even when I was a young person, and that seems to be a long time ago, I remember I went to a school that went from grade to kindergarten to sixth grade. And then I went to junior high, and then I went to high school. Now, before I went to junior high at sixth grade, they had a graduation ceremony. Sixth grade, but anyway, graduation ceremony. And I remember the principal getting up, and it's still with me. She got up and she said, now to all you graduates of sixth grade, hit your wagon to a star and grab on and you can become anything you want and you could be anything you want to be. Oh, I was all excited about that. But I didn't have a wagon to hitch to a star. But nonetheless, that was her phrase she used. But you know, that philosophy is still with us today. We still teach our young people that they can go anywhere they want to be, they can become anything they want to be, they can have anything they want, and they can do anything they want. Little did they know that once they get out in the real world, those plans come crashing down. So what did they do? They run home to mommy and daddy and live in the basement. And that's what they're doing, a lot of these young people today. They don't want to work. They don't want to do anything. They just want to be supported. And when a candidate comes along and says, free Medicare to all, and says, uh, free uh, salary to everyone, even if you want to work or don't want to work, we're going to give you a minimum income. Oh, man, this is the cat's meow, isn't it? Uh, so they're all for this sort of stuff, and they'll vote for anyone who give them all those kind of things. Well, back to the church here. Uh, they were living that kind of life here. Uh, they adopted this idea of practical atheism, meaning that, well, God really wasn't behind our lives, and we could do anything we wanted. And Christian hedonism, as I guess you could call that as well here. But it was the height of what amounts to perhaps uh, apostasy. Now, keeping that in mind here, think about that. So James says, why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. Who here knows what's going to happen tomorrow? Please raise your hand. Oh, but no. I don't even know what's going to happen this afternoon. Do you? <laughs> so, yes, that's really the truth. So James says, what is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. And, of course, we've all seen that, seen that in early morning. A mist will come in. Perhaps if you've never been near the water, I grew up uh, near the Long Island Sound, uh, and I, I, I saw the early morning <coughs> mist so often come in that by uh, 10.30, 11 o'clock in the morning, if the sun was out, it would, it would uh, dissipate and be gone. Well, that's our lives today. Now, I want to give you some shocking statistics here for them uh, that picture this. The overwhelming majority of Christians in America today, uh, this is a statistic, live their lives with little to no difference from the unsaved world around them. That's right. Number two, in fact, some of the kindest, nicest, authentic, and wonderful people I have met don't know Jesus Christ. And yet, in churches, some of the most horrible, mean, and downright disgusting Christians are operating churches all around our country today. And it's true. Number two, for many Christians, their overall goal is to strive to gain as much material possessions as their unsaved neighbors. Think about that as well. And number three, many American Christians have adopted cultural and ethical standards with little to no regard to God's principles of clarity that are written down in the Word of God. And number four, although many Christians give lip service to faith in God, I believe in Jesus, they strangely live as though Jesus and God doesn't exist. And this life is all that there is. That's American Christianity today. And such Christian living, according to James, was the height of arrogance because it was going on in his day, disobedience, and may reflect actual apostasy. Remember, we studied the book of Jude. Apostasy is someone who has come to see all the wonders and good things that Christianity has. To see all the blessings that Jesus Christ is going to flow and bestow upon people who become his followers. They see all these things and they want them. And they figure that being in the midst of Christian people, they're going to get it. And so they do get some of them in a practical way. But they don't have the peace that passes all understanding that comes to your heart and mind when you believe in Jesus. 
And so after a period of time, although maybe they've walked an aisle, maybe they've signed a decision card, maybe they've said, I believe in Jesus and raised their hand, and maybe they've given the offering every Sunday, yet they are not saved because they have not surrendered their heart or their life to Jesus Christ. And after a while, you know what? All those things in the Christian church get old. And they don't care anymore. And so they leave. And then they criticize the church and they criticize Jesus Christ. They criticize the Bible and everything there. And they say, I tried God and it doesn't work. That's called an apostate. They are not believers who turned away from God. They're not believers who lost their salvation. That's false theology. They are false believers who never had salvation. And they went out from the church. And you know what? The Bible says they went out from the church because they never had the salvation that God had for them. So keep that in mind. So James is really talking about that, and he's really alluding to that, but at the same time saying that true believers can get off the rails too. And this is what was happening there. True believers were getting off the rails. So the principle of forgetting God can happen in a believer's life. You get all balled up in the world around you and maybe your job or the business you've started or whatever it might be. And before long, it seems like you're running the show and that you're the one who has to do all these things. So therefore, you're the one who's going to produce the blessings. And we forget all about the fact that God wants to be there in your life and in these things here. So with that in mind, it's really important. Apart from the knowledge and will of God, you know, life is really a mystery. We don't really know what's even out there tomorrow. But of course, in the lives that we live, we live in a fallen, sinful world, tragedies can strike, failures can come in our lives and be experienced, and life as a whole can grind to a halt for us, can it? And the unsafe heart will do what? The unsafe heart will cry, foul or unfair, why did this happen to me? Even believers sometimes say that. And even our youth secular education, as I said, earlier here a moment ago, they can do anything they want, they can be anything that they want to be, they can have anything they want to have. In reality, what a letdown will be when they enter into the world in which we live. For even the Bible says that is not so at all. So indeed, the complexity and the uncertainty of life teaches us all, you and I really have little say about what can happen to us. There's simply too many factors in the world in which we live that make up life and living around us. You and I have no ability to control. So therefore, our lives to totally, as a believer in Christ, are under the control of one thing, the sovereign will of God. What he allows to happen or to come into our lives. You know, because the young people don't understand that, and they have been brought up that way, uh, they look at life and before long they become very depressed about it and a lot of them do what? They commit suicide. You know, six statistics for suicide today really need to be understood. Number one, suicide is the leading cause of death for children ages 10 to 18. What's the number one cause of death? Accidents, all kinds of accidents. Number two, suicide is the second leading cause of death for college age young people 18 to 24. This is terrible when you think about that. Number three, more teenagers and young adults die from suicide than from cancer and heart disease, AIDS, birth defects, stroke, pneumonia, influenza, chronic lung diseases. Put them all together as well. And then the f number four, each day in our nation, the, the leading cause of death is 3,041 suicide attempts by young people in grades 9 to 12. And those who live are often seriously crippled for life. Number five, females attempt suicide three times more often than males, but many fail and live. However, males die by suicide more than four times as often than the females. Apparently, they're more successful. Number six, causes of suicide include depression, mental illness, substance abuse, aggression, fighting, the death of a loved one, loss of value relationships, parental divorce, or even sexual abuse. There was a psychiatrist uh, I, I came across, Andrew Slaby, who wrote this. We have been unable to respond to our children and teens when they're in their greatest emotional pain. We really don't know what to tell them. And that's true. Without God, you do not know what to tell them. You know, America's not alone because you can go around the world in Europe and Russia. 
uh, the suicide rate is even greater than in America itself. And of course, look at the tremendous abuse of drugs that's going on, the opioid epidemic, and drinking by youth that is out there. The truth is, they've been taught they can live life without a sovereign God. And as a result, they can rule their own lives. But they know they can't. And they know there's nothing they can do for themselves here. And of course, the Bible warns all of us that you and I, we cannot handle life without a sovereign God and keeper over us. And we know humankind was created by God. The Bible tells us that very thing. And none of us will ever find our rest or peace elsewhere. You know, before I got saved, I tried to find my rest and peace in life in everything. In having a family, in having a good job, in earning a lot of money, and being able to buy all the toys that we wanted, you know. And uh, I got them all. But it didn't bring me any happiness. And that, that loss of uh, knowing that it was hopeless and fruitless for me is what drove me to Jesus Christ. And I am so thankful. But youth are not alone in suicide. You and I generally are younger, are your older folks here. You know that the uh, suicide rate among the elderly is the highest of all. Here's a chart from cradle to grave, going from this end here. 17 and younger, the percentage is 3. 18 to 24, 13, 24 to 44, 15, 45 to 54, uh, 20, is that 29 to 20. Okay, and then of course the next one there is uh, 33. That's 55 and older. Older men are at the highest risk of committing suicide than older women. White males aged 75 and older are at the highest risk among all adult, uh, older adults. And likewise, losses include the death of a loved one, uh, also potential loss of self. As we get older, we lose the abilities that we had of uh, being an individual before. How hard it becomes, extremely difficult to accept and manage that as we become older. Now, for you and I, we have a crutch. We have the Lord Jesus Christ in our heart, and he enables us to manage it. But can you imagine getting old without Christ? I can't. Not at all what it's going to bring. Now, of course, it brings people to the state of meaninglessness and hopelessness, and that's where suicide is contemplated. Now, because of this, two things James addresses about life that you and I need to go through. Number one, the principle of forgetting God. When we forget God, of course... Then the problems begin. Now the first principle of forgetting God is summed up in the area of the brevity of life. That's what James is talking about here. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. This is perhaps the most repeated scene in the Bible. And of course it all goes back to the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned and God said something unique to Adam. God said this to Adam. For dust you are and to dust you will return. And that goes for you, that goes for you, 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 and for me. We are but dust, and to dust we will return. We're a mist that appears for a moment and vanishes. How quickly you've reached old age, am I right? How quickly, all of a sudden, life just flashed by for us, and how much time will we have left as we grow older at that as well. So it's something to think about. Job had something to say about it, and it was pretty good. Job said, My days are swifter than a weaver's shovel, and they come to an end without hope. As a cloud vanishes and is gone, so one who goes down to the grave and does not return. He went on to say, For we were born only yesterday, and you know nothing, and our days on earth are but a shadow. Job 9.25 My days are swifter than a runner. They fly away without a glimpse of joy. And lastly, Job said in chapter 14, Mortals born of women are few days and full of trouble. They spring up like flowers and wither away like fleeting shadows. They do not endure. How true it really is. And of course, the psalmist said it well, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. So since our lives are brief, we cannot afford to spend them foolishly or begin to think that we are on the throne to rule our own lives. You know, there's only three things you can do with your life. You can waste your life, you can spend your life, or you can invest your life in God's work and will. Now, the unsaved, they don't know anything else but to waste their lives. And in the end, they're going to be thrown on the trash heap of eternity, which is called the lake of fire. But now we come to what James, James is talking about, the era of Christians, mind you, Christians, 
living like the unsaved, by neglecting or refusing to remember the sovereignty of God and in their existence, especially their new life in Christ that they have embraced. How important it really is. Now this brings us to the next thing, and that is, of course, the pre precept of forsaking God. Verses 16 to 17. Take, take a look. As it is, James says, what are they doing? These people who were the leaders of the churches, they were boasting in their arrogant schemes. We'll talk about that in a moment. All such boasting, he says, is evil. And of course, the sin of boasting suggests that we claim to be able to control our own destiny. Boasting here suggests, suggests that you have the power to rule and the course direction of your life. James said if you do that, your boasting is evil because you don't have it. So James says, look at the foolishness. Living without God ruling your days and lives. It's a fatal flaw. For James, it appeared that many Christians, and apparently business Christians, I guess, uh, were living as if God didn't exist. They were going to go to another city and make lots of money and profit uh, by what they were going to sell or do. But they made no plans to take God with them. And of course, they didn't take into consideration that God's will and kingdom work on the matter might have said no for them to go to another city and to work. How sad many Christians do the same thing. Even groups of churches uh, work that very way. They're only based on management principles or consultants, business analysts, and of course, shrewd judgment to run the business or the church. Many churches, big ones at that, operate in that basis there. And ultimately, God is left out. Perhaps the greatest area of use in the Christian business world, you know where it is today? It's in the business world of publishing and music. You think about that. Many Christian businesses that started out well eventually joined forces with unsaved businesses. And they took over. Now, why did these unsaved businesses want to join with the Christian businesses? You know why? The profit ratio was so dynamic. It was more than they were making in the secular world. They wanted to get involved in the Christian world of publishing and books and CDs and music, you name it. And so they offered lots of money to buy into the Christian businesses. And many of the Christian businesses allowed them to do that. And here's some of them right on the screen here today. And so they buy into Christian organizations because of the tremendous profit margin here. Now, when they joined forces, the Christians, with the unsaved world, eventually they began to leave God out. And they were no different than the heathens themselves. But you know, God had a term for the unsaved in these business uh, arrangements, as well as the Christians in these business arrangements. He called them fools. Look at the Bible. It's full of that phrase. Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and their deeds are vile. Psalm 107, verse 17. Some become fools, though their rebellious ways suffered affliction because of their iniquities. Proverbs 1, 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. In other words, they ignore it. Proverbs 1, verse 22. How long will you who are simple love your simple ways? How long will you mockery, delight in mockery, and fools hate knowledge? And Proverbs 10, verse 8, the wise and hard accept commands, but the chattering fool comes to ruin. Now, the definition of a fool, it's important to understand this in Scripture, is not someone who is stupid or ignorant. That's not the Bible's definition. The Bible's definition is simply someone who simply leaves God out of their lives. They have no place for Him. And God says they're a fool. Now they could be highly intelligent. They could be people who are wealthy. They could be important people in our community or in churches here as well. Or they could be poor and uneducated people. It really doesn't matter. But God calls all of them fools when they leave God out of their lives. So there we have the precept of forsaking God. Now, of course, the next one is the fortune and the future as well. Now, there are two basic reasons Christians will sink to the level of a boasting fool. And what is that? By leaving God out. Because of sinful pride, because they can't or don't want to believe that God has the right to make the decisions that's better than your or their decision there. 
And it's, another one is simply ignorance. There are a lot of Christians who are not taught properly that God needs to rule their lives. Many Christians today are ignorant of the nature of God's will. Many think God's will is an option. But James says God's will is not an option. It is a command for everyone who believes in Jesus Christ. Now God has created us and we are his subjects and as Christians we are bought by his sacrificial death and therefore he has the right to rule your life. And in the process God wants us to glorify him by allowing him to rule. How? In our bodies and in our spirit and in our living day by day. 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20. So boasting of what you independently do in life is evil. You are not in control. God is in control. And that is why its fortune and future is worthless in the process there. Now, scheming, arrogant schemes. What did James mean by that? He means the idea of going out and doing something, maybe producing something or, or building something or functioning, some, something you come up with a plan to do and you believe is going to do great things for you. Well, if God isn't involved in it and God isn't the center of it and God doesn't have the last say in it, then you are scheming in the faith and scheming in the faith is sin. So, Kind of remember and keep that in your mind. That's what it's all about there. Now with that in mind too here, uh, the next thing is Proverbs 16.33. We may throw the dice, but the Lord determines how they fall. You see, man's boasting accomplishments just cover up our own personal weakness because we don't know what tomorrow will bring and we're not in control of tomorrow as well. God is though. God is in absolute control. So, you may go out and do your thing, but you are not going to get away with doing your thing because God is going to determine how it will pan out. Indeed it is. God is sovereign. Now, it's important to understand the sovereignty of God because without the sovereignty of God, you really don't understand that. The sovereignty of God means that God is absolutely in uh, powerful control of everything. And rightly so. If he can just breathe the world into existence, he can do anything. And he is in control. And it's important to see that. Job said, and this is paraphrased, but the wisdom of the past will teach you, the experience of others will speak to you, reminding you that those who forget God have no hope. Indeed it's true. Many today are doing the same. So don't get attached to anything in this world. The things of the world are not evil in them of themselves, obviously there. But when you use them without God's permission, then it is wrong. And don't begin to seek and use things exclusively for yourself. Begin to allow God to have the right to overrule them if you choose them in your life. And again, the psalmist says even more. I'll paraphrase it again here for you. But God says to evil men, recite my laws no longer and stop claiming my promises. For you have refused my discipline, disregarding my laws. I remained silent, and you thought I didn't care. But now your time of punishment has come, and I list all the above charges against you. We had a whole list of charges. This is the last chance for all of you who have forgotten God before I tear you apart, and no one can help you then. Boy, that's pretty strong, pretty uh, severe there. But that's what God is saying. I have the last say. And if you keep ignoring me, I'm going to come into your life and show you that I have the last say. Now James looks at us uh, and tells us in verse 17 important words. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. So we might ask, what happens to a Christian who deliberately and continuously ignores God's will and goes about doing their own will for their lives? Well, James 17 tells us. If anyone does that, then it is sin for them. And it's a warning for us that we are not to encroach on God's territory. What territory is that? The right for God to rule everything in your life and mine. And that goes for no matter what you think you can do on your own. You first should ask God about that very thing. So what happens to believers who purportedly disobey these commands of God, the Bible says 
that one day soon they will be chastened, as we saw in the Psalms there, and they'll be chastened because you have a loving Father over you who cares for you. And until you submit, you will not enter into the blessings of the Lord. Now, the writer of Hebrews, I went too quick there, let me get back here. The writer of Hebrews says this in chapter 12, And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement? that addresses you as a father addresses his son. It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's disciplines, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Now look, endure hardships as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons, and daughters of all. So God is saying that if you're not going to allow me to rule in your life, I'm going to have to simply come into your life and I'm going to help you learn that I am the sovereign ruler of all things, including your life. Paul wrote to the Romans, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing and perfect will. You can't have that until you allow God the right to rule in your lives. And of course, the writer to uh, Colossians, which is again the Apostle Paul, says it well. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, and not as human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are receiving, uh, you're serving. So don't leave God out of home. Don't leave God out of your heart. Don't leave God out of your career, which seemed to be going on there in uh, James' day. And don't leave God out of any job or schooling or any friendships or any course of business or any finances that you are seeking to go through. Remember, disobey, disobeying or rejecting God's word and will for your life for the moment may not seem serious, but in the end, He will examine you and bring about His judgments for you and for you. Now, with all those things in mind, we come to the third thing, and that is the promise of following God. If you follow God, James is saying, here's what you're going to receive. You're going to receive an irrevocable relationship that can never be taken away, and you're going to receive an imperishable relationship that is going to be filled with joy and happiness and blessing as well. All right? James 4, verse 15. So instead of all these things, you want to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. That's what it means to allow God to have His way. Now, this expression, a lot of people sometimes say, well, it's the Lord's will. Well, they don't even mean if it's the Lord's will. It's just an expression. But you should mean it. If it is the Lord's will, what it is, is you're asking. You're making plans to do this or that or go there, or to be this or to be that. And when you're all done making the plans, you need to ask God, is this within the scope of your will? Is this the will for me, for my days ahead, for my family that are ahead, uh, for my brothers and sisters in the Lord, if I'm leading in a church? If it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or do that. Now, with that in mind, you know, Jesus said something unique, and I've often thought about it, John 4, 34. Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to fill it, finish his work. You and I have the will of the Father in the Word of God. Now, remembrance of God's will, of course, is important. And I want to give you three things that will help you remember that. Number one, God's will always comes from His heart. We know that in all things, God works uh, for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. For those God foreknew, He predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Now, what that's really saying is that the moment you become a believer in Christ, you know, we live in time. We can't explain this, so don't bother trying to explain this. But we live in time, and we must go through time. But God lives in eternity. And when you and I become a uh, part of God, you are instantly in eternity. I believe this. I'm already in heaven right now. I'm living in eternity with God. 
and you are living in eternity with God. But for now, I must live here until I get there in the mind and heart in which I am. But as far as God is concerned, it's already completed in the process here. So think about that. Colossians 1.18 says that. This is a verse I memorized when I was first saved. That in all things, Christ might have the preeminence. You know, I put that on my business card in one of my churches I was serving. When I was down at the printer, the printer looked at that and he says, what does that mean that in all things Christ might have the preeminence? He said, I never heard that word. That's not a well-known word. So I told him, why don't you look it up? So I, he, he said he would do that. And I came the next day to pick up my business cards. And he said, I know what the word preeminence means. I said, what is it? He said, top dog. <laughs> Well, that's really true. He put it in colloquialism, but indeed, preeminence, that in all things in your life, in the church, in the fellowship, in the world in which you live, Christ must have the preeminence, the supremacy. He must be top dog. Amen. And you're the one who can make that a reality in your life. And how important it really is. But now, when you do that, understand this. Let me back that up again for a second here. Did I get there? There it is. Number one, God's will always comes from his heart. If God is never going to lead you in some place that's going to be bad for you, or it's not going to be good, or you aren't in the end going to enjoy it, if you do it according to God's will. So it's important for you to do that. But the next thing is, I want to get there. There we are. Number two, disobedience to God's will never cancels it. You know, the devil tries to tell you that, that if you fail in doing the will of God, it's over for you. You're not going to have any other chance. God is going to lay you aside in the gutter, and he might pick you up and drag you into heaven at a later date. But, but as far as the world and your life is concerned, it's over, buddy, and you're not going to have another chance. That's what the devil says, but not according to God. Instead, you are to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do that. If you disobey God's will, if you're willing to turn from the direction you went that wasn't God's will for you, and come back and do God's will, God is going to put you on the right path and send you there. You know, there's good examples of that. Think about that for a minute here because it's important uh, for that. Think of someone uh, who uh, went and got out of God's will and God put him back on the path. I spoke of him last week. His name was Abraham. Remember, Abraham saw this... Uh, in the, in the land of uh, Israel there, this famine. And as a result of that, he went down to Israel where there was no famine. But God didn't want him to leave and go down there. But when he went down there, he sinned against God. He almost lost his life. He's lucky he got out of there, but he got out of there because God rescued him and brought him where? Back into the land to continue to do the will had, uh, God had for him. Well, even in the land, what did Abraham do? He heard that God was going to give him a son, and they weren't going to have a son. And, you know, his wife was going beyond the age of childbearing, and he decided that, uh, well, he's talked it over with Sarah, and she said, well, take my concubine and go have sex with her and produce a son. And so he did. There was Ishmael. Was that God's will? No, Ishmael was not God's will. But even though he sinned against God, when the time came, and when Sarah was no longer able to bear a child, and Abraham as well, that's when God brought the miracle child called Isaac. So you see, God brought, brought him back to do what the will of God was. How important it is for that very thing here. So the disobedience to God's will never cancels it. So for those of us who neglected or refused it, are out of God's will, we must believe that God will bring us back. How do we know that? Let me give you scripture. Psalm 33, verse 11. The plans of the Lord stand forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. If God gives you a command to do, and you are willing to do it, even if it's at the last day of your life, God is going to give you the opportunity to do it, because that is his plans and his purpose. And you know, here's a good expression. I don't know who gave it, but it's not mine. When God cannot rule, he overrules. In everything in life, when God cannot rule, he will overrule if you will turn to him and do what is right. So how important it really is. It is. So think about that very thing there. Now with that in mind here, we come to the third one. There it is. 
the lifelong consistent obedience to God's will always brings the fullest and best blessings. You know, God's will always comes from his heart, number one. Number two, disobedience to God's will never cancels it. And number three, lifelong consistent obedience to God's will always brings the fullest and best blessings. So which one should you take? Number three, of course, start living for the Lord and continue living to the day he calls you home. How we need to remember this. And James is trying to tell the people in the, the uh, churches there if they would get back to God's will and stop living with him out of the will of God, he would bless them. Now it's important. However, we may not understand God's will, and it isn't always clear to us, but nonetheless, it's there. You know, we can go back to the beginning of James. Remember what James said in uh, James 1, 17 to 18? Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he has created. Every good gift and perfect isn't produced by you. It comes from above. And God is just waiting to pour it into your life when you walk in total obedience to Him. So all you and I as believers need to do is examine our lives. Have you been like these Christians in James Day before? They wanted to run everybody else's life. They wanted to tell them how they were going to live and what would be the principles of living for them. And then they condemned them and they judged their brothers and sisters uh, because they weren't living the way they wanted them to live. And then they went to the second sin, and that was they were not going to let God rule their own lives. And now they had to turn away from ruling their own lives, going where they want, earning what they wanted, when they wanted, or at least thought they could, and now allow God to totally rule their lives, their church fellowship and their lives. And that's the choice that you have, and anyone listening to this message today, are you going to allow God to rule your life? And if you will, you will capture God's fullest blessing. Now, if you have that outline sheet on the back, I have some uh, uh, words there. You can fill them in uh, yourself from the screen here. Ursula said to me when she saw the outline sheet, she said, you think we are uh, blind and can't read? Why is that print so large? <laughs> right? She didn't like the large print anyway. I did that for everybody, all right? All right, number one here. We must set out or return to perform and practice God's known will for our lives. When you do this, God will begin the process of opening the way that was closed and giving further light for you on his path. Number two, we must prove God's will. How? By our personal experience of it. Think about that. You have to step out and do God's will that maybe you previously turned away from or you previously neglected. So, you don't have to take big steps. Take baby steps, but take steps. God will give you personal experience of His direction, His care, and His keeping. Number three, when uh, we start doing things we know we ought to do, which we haven't done before or recently, God will begin the blessing promise in there. It's important. You know, you've heard this expression, the journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. And it does for us as well. So don't be idle. Move out. Trust God to guide and keep you at it. And then number four, we must first seek to make and see God's will operative. Where? In the place where we reside. Our home and in our family life with those who are around us. Our spouses and our children. Or maybe our grandchildren or whatever is around us right there. And it's important for that very thing. So start by assessing your home life. Your relationship with your spouse or your children. Men, let me ask this question. Are you gentle, kind, and loving as a leader of your home? And wives, are you submissive? Are you supportive of your husband's role as he tries to do these things and to honor God? A right relationship on both sides is important. Number five, we must begin today to seek to know and be directed to God's plan. And how do we do that? By asking Him daily through prayer and meditation. Where? In his word. So, how important it is. Begin regular personal Bible study outside of coming to church on Sunday here. And uh, get a Bible plan for reading his word for your life. Establish a prayer closet. A prayer closet means to just get alone with God. 
Now, there's nothing wrong with getting uh, together with God and your spouse, but find a place where you can alone do it. Maybe it's late at night. Maybe it's early in the morning. But take time to do that very thing. Time alone with God, and God will meet you there and begin the plan of bringing His fullest blessings into your life. These are the steps of God for these blessings to flow and to experience the intimacy of a believer who walks with the Lord. And when you do that, that will begin the process of the wonderful and purposeful, sovereign, submissive will of God that will unfold in every life of every Christian, in every church family of every believer. Let's pray. Heavenly God, thank you for all these things, and I just pray that we will indeed continue our own walk of life to uh, capture uh, the fullest blessings that you have for us. Lord, these blessings will be different from each and every other, one of us, but nonetheless, they will be joyful. They will be exciting. Uh, they will be a sure fire uh, means of uh, promoting uh, our Christian experience to be the blessing of all eternity. And I just pray that it will be a reality for everyone who's listening to me today. And if there's someone who doesn't know Jesus Christ, the first blessing that they need is to be saved from their sins. And that blessing can only come when they look into heaven to see Jesus clearly as the Savior of the world, as their Savior, that he went to a cross, this perfect, sinless God-man went to the cross to die for the sins of the world, which includes my sin and your sin and others as well. And because his sins, I mean, because our sins have been placed on the cross and God has forgiven them through Christ, Jesus offers his forgiveness if you will surrender your heart and accept him as the Lord God of your life and the Savior of your uh, soul. All those things will bring the blessings of eternity. The greatest blessing of all that we look forward to is heaven and eternal life. And the other blessings, of course, will follow in suit. And all these for a believer who follows Jesus. This we ask and we pray in Jesus' most wonderful name. Amen.